and After School to the Studio, which is a panel with Rebecca Torsha, Gordon Bellamy, Pip Courtney, Aaron Tibbalt, and Chanel Ward. Uh, they all have all the places that they work on here, but they can introduce themselves. Um, they are going to showcase innovative programs seeking to empower underrepresented students to acquire skills to study and make video games. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Thank you so much. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. My name is Stephanie Leto, and I am the program manager at Games for Change. I am thrilled to be able to share this stage with these incredible human beings. So you are all, again, about to hear a, a conversation about the incredible things that our communities and our partners are doing for the next generation of diverse creators. One such program that I would like to briefly mention is called SYSTEM, C-Y-S-T-E-M. And SYSTEM is a one-of-a-kind grants program empowering underrepresented students at the high school and graduate levels to pursue academic and professional careers in video games. Participating students will receive resources to help them develop their skills and to accomplish their goals, including access to funding, mentorship, educational opportunities, and even access to industry insider events. The ultimate goal of SYSTEM is to create a community of students and industry members who will help ensure the diverse, that diversification thrives within the video game industry. SYSTEM is funded and supported by a team of cross-sector partnerships, some of whom are on this panel today with me including the ESA, Bigglesworth Family Foundation, Take Two, Gay Gaming Professionals, Urban Arts, and Games for Change. Games for Change is thrilled to announce our students' nominations for this incredible new program, which includes Angelo Simpson from Atlanta, Yangtze Rodriguez from Los Angeles, Celeste Nguyen from New York City, Monica Paredes, from Los Angeles, and Delfino Leon from New York City. Through their involvement in the Games for Change Student Challenge, these students have demonstrated immense talent and passion for making games. We are so excited to see what they accomplish through this incredible new program. And you will hear so much more here today. So with that, I am happy to introduce you to the moderator of this panel, Rebecca Torsha, editor of EdTech, focused on K-12 magazine. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to From the Classroom and After School uh, to the Studio. Uh, I'm Rebecca Torsha. I'll be your moderator for today's panel. With us, we have four very accomplished, forward-thinking panelists who are highly respected in the video game, education, and nonprofit world. But before I formally introduce them, I'd like to set up the premise for this panel. We can all agree that there are many great stories being told and shared through video games. But we also know that stories speaking to entire segments of the game-playing population have yet to be told. And part of the reason is that those who are eager to tell and share those stories are underrepresented in the creation of video games, not just as game makers, but as decision makers, those who say yes or no to the creation and production of new games. Recent events like the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement have emphasized the gap between those who have the resources to succeed and those who do not. Fortunately, many have recognized this gap and begun to do something about it, but there's a long way to go and we must be creative to get there. One key to moving forward is access, granting younger students access to educational programs and older students, those in high school and college, access to the industry. As with any industry, technical skills only go so far. Students need to develop important skills like networking, creating portfolios, and presenting themselves as job candidates. And they need mentors to help them, which is why we've brought these panelists together. 
They are all people who, for years, if not decades, have worked tirelessly to create new pathways for underrepresented <coughs> youth to find their potential. As you will see, their efforts to identify and nurture talents, instilling in students the confidence that they can create not only video games, but create video games as a viable career path. Let's jump in. With us, we have Gordon Bellamy, who has a long, storied history in the video game industry, starting with his work on Madden NFL back in its early days and extending to many high-profile positions in the industry. He is also a professor at USC and CEO of Gay Gaming Professionals, which collaborates with many industry partners on programs benefiting underrepresented students and game creators. <coughs> we have Pip Courtney, who is the CEO of Urban Arts, a nonprofit that helps underrepresented students explore their creativity and access technology to define their futures. Through various programs, it has worked with 250 schools and 255,000 K-12 students. Its School of Interactive Arts is a multi-year pre-college program which teaches high school students the art and science of game development. Aaron Thibault, VP of Strategic Operations at Gearbox, began his career in game design and production, but he has also taught at the college level and helped develop a game dev program at Southern Methodist University. He's currently spearheading the development of an online platform which seeks to democratize game development tools for students to help them gain entry to the industry. And finally, we have Chanel Ward, Director of Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Take-Two Interactive. She's a longtime expert in DEI, having worked in higher education and as a consultant. She looks closely at an organization or company's culture, assesses what changes need to be made, then suggests best practices for improving the culture and bolstering growth. She's also had extensive experience in developing and managing mentorship programming. Welcome, panelists. Let's open the floor with a question for everyone. What do you consider some of the most critical gaps in supporting underrepresented young people in studying and making games, and if they so choose, building a career in the game industry? All right, happy to kick us off. Um, so very simply, two things come top of mind for me. Uh, the first is an awareness, right? So raising the bar, raising the awareness of the disproportionality when it comes to representation. So very simply, <laughs> sharing with your community, sharing with your networks, really, really being able to understand what the data tells us around representation. Um, so beyond that, having metrics in place to collect that data, right, and, and really being able to see the, the full scope. And then the second is a commitment, a commitment by way of a strategic plan, right? So really being able to take this, this data and action it um, with a multi-year multi -year plan. Jump back in, Mike. Um, I think there's a there's a value chain from consumption, right? Of games, like everybody consumes games. We see the stats all the time. ESA puts out stats. Everyone consumes, especially underrepresented people seem to over-index for consuming games. There's the production and creation of games, which is you know craft that we all sort of share and are pushing people into through programs. And then there's the the ownership and distribution of games, where I think underrepresented people are vastly underrepresented, and there is a um, an energy and inertia that those who own games are able to provide that pulls people forward through the ecosystem. Like if you notice the programs we're gonna talk about, right? Ultimately it's people who own games who are like, oh, this would be great. Underrepresented people, this would be so cool, right? And so they'll go, stop consuming and start creating and educating yourself in hopes that someday, maybe a generation from now, you will own games and be able to do that you know, for yourself and be sort of self-sufficient. I think that's the biggest thing is like in just that, that outcome of, of owning games and distributing games, getting that word out. I think we have to normalize the idea of working in the game industry or any related industry for people who otherwise don't see it as a pathway for themselves. And I think the, the biggest gaps to um, young people seeing themselves is uh, they don't have an identity that tells them this is an obvious pathway for them. And I think we have to break through that, and we have to do it systematically. Yes, agree. Um, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And that's why it's important to bring uh, game uh, development programs into schools, into communities where the students show up every day. Um, that's, that's the first one we address. Secondly, uh, the students we serve, it's interesting. The, the, their parents often don't see uh, game design, game development, a career in the gaming industry as a real thing. And uh, that's a systemic sort of perception barrier we always have to uh, work with. 
And then lastly, we're going to talk about it in a little minute, um, attainable um, post-secondary programs for young people to go to college and study this, but you know, perhaps not pay the big dollars um, you know, that NYU and USC and all these great things, our students go to those colleges, but not all of them. And so we need to have a more um, equitable, uh, reachable uh, program system for them. Wonderful. Uh, you mentioned uh, a lot of the hurdles that uh, young people face uh, in joining this industry. Uh, Gordon, you're someone who has had to clear many hurdles on your path to being a game maker, and you've dedicated much of your career to supporting others and clearing hurdles for them. How is gay gaming professionals helping today's youth break into the business? Well, sure. So those you don't know, we're a nonprofit, been around 17 years now, um, and our mission is education, employment, expertise, and entrepreneurship. So specifically, um, programs we talked about the system, which we're a part of. Um, so um, the thing I always talk about is like what it's like to come from a good family. And what that means is the, a context of supporting your, your mental health, your financial health, um, your academic health, um, uh, your emotional health, so that you can then iterate and succeed in whatever your path is. And games is one of them, right? There's many different forms of expression. You can be good at all sorts of stuff. But if you don't have that sort of support, well, then it's hard to iterate. You can go undefeated like a, like a, like a UFC fighter. Like you'll see people who are exceptional, right? They never lost nothing, perfect SATs, blah, blah, blah. But for most people who need to iterate as humans, they need that kind of support. So that's what we do. So we partner, right, with, we partner with you, partner with you, partner with you, partner with y'all out there um, to create um, programs which have, like, PIPT identified uh, time, because you need time to grow, right? All you can do really is harvest people at their current value. Like, you're really smart, right? Versus these five kids that you just announced, right? We just meet them now but we now have time with them. They're like high school juniors, right? So by the time they enter the workplace, we got like six years you know, to cultivate them into all they can be and to sort of set their expectations that they should be in, the, they should be in this room, right? With all of y'all, like whoever got y'all here. Um, anyway, that's what we do. Um, lots of ways we do it, but anyway, that's what's up. Wonderful. Aaron, from an executive's perspective, and maybe using Gearbox as an example, how can companies do a better job of enabling underrepresented young people uh, and supporting them to gain access to and excel in the industry? Like, it's such a big question, but I think that talking about time, as Gordon just did, we have to give our time. We have to allow people within our companies to be able to schedule their time with underrepresented youth and students who are interested in these pathways, and we need to build mentorship programs that formalize those connections and stick with the learners and us in the industry together over time. Um, so I, I think that that's the number one thing, is making sure that we're available, we schedule it, we make it um, known within our organizations that we support this, we embrace it, and that it's allowed for uh, everyone within the organization to spend their time on these things. Um, it's the number one question we get asked is, if, if I'm a developer in the trenches on a project, when do I get to do this? Mm. Or if I'm an executive and I have a lot of p &L work to do, when do I have time to do this? So we have to make it part of our company cultures to do it. Certainly. Uh, Pip, one of Urban Arts' programs is the School of Interactive Arts. Could you describe how that helps young people uh, bridge the gaps that you guys have been talking about? Yes, thank you. What a great question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, as, as Gordon said, uh, you know, we've, we go into schools uh, in a systemic way and, and, and work with students there, but we also have a program that we find students in the ninth grade. And they stay with us for about three years. Uh, they do about 1,000 hours. Of, of work from coding to animation to music production to storytelling to college access work to everything. It's a big hug for those students. Um, and Gordon's met them actually. Gordon came a few months ago and sat with them. And you know our students uh, as well as I do. But, um, and, and they go off to top colleges. They go to USC, they go to NYU. They go um, with, often with big scholarships. Um, but not all of them do, and since that program has been growing in the past uh, five years, it's only five years old, so it's still relatively new, we're graduating more and more students, but not all of them get that big scholarship to NYU, and they get into NYU, but um, they don't get that, you know, 250 grand package, and we actually advise them, don't go to NYU, because you can't, 
you know, you cannot be saddled with that debt um, when you graduate because that's, that's really, really, really difficult. The, all these students come from low-income communities, right? So I just want to recognize some colleagues over there, Nicholas Fortunio and Barry Joseph, because we've been uh, concocting this program and the, the contracts were just signed relatively recently, ink barely dried, with the city, with the city New York City, and um, with CUNY, which is City College of New York up in Harlem, and in uh, New York City, uh, there is a two-year community college degree offered by Hostos, but there is no undergraduate game design, game development degree in existence, but there is now. So we're creating this program in the next two years. That will actually be a real thing that students from SIA will be able to graduate and go to CUNY, perhaps pay zero dollars in tuition, even though they may not get a scholarship, or perhaps they're paying five, eight grand a year, right? So you talk about underrepresented students, you talk about equity, you talk about the opportunity to you know, democratize game development, get more um, underrepresented students into that. It's a great project. We're right at the beginning. They're going to be talking about it tomorrow, uh, so go, go check that out too. Wonderful. Uh, Gordon, to your mind, uh, are there other ways universities can increase underrepresented students in their game design programs and help ensure that they're successful in developing a career in the video game industry? Sure. I, I think the word underrepresented gets conflated with under-resourced, mm -hmm. right? I think that, um, at least in my experience, I teach at USC, number one game program, all that good stuff, right? But the, the challenge that number I Number one find, in the country, right? Well, so they say. You know what? They are all number one in their own ways. <laughs> um, but, but, um, but the point being that it, it's, it's only a number one experience if you have the resource information to be successful, right? I think anyone's gone to any workplace, right? Any of us. And some people have simply more information, whether it be because their families have the information, their colleagues have the information, right? They're coming with a real warm intro to the setting. And I think that um, the opportunity we all share through these programs, through all the things we're talking about, is how do we supplement young people with resource and information to be as good as they are. I mean, there are talent, I mean, you, I, look, your kids, right? They're all super talented, super smart. They just don't necessarily have all the resources at their disposal, like the computers and at their fingertips till they come to your studio, right? To do all they could do. Um, the opportunity to learn about games isn't, you know, there, the mentorship, until they connect with you, connect with you to actually have mentors who are in the trenches. And I guess, like, it's just exciting. I mean, like, we didn't all know each other, right, till these programs happened, and we're, in it, like you've heard our bios, right? We're all in it, but we didn't know each other, like until like well, I knew you forever, but like these like for the, this past year, right? And so I think it's a fantastic new era, right, of us all working together to try to sort of raise the tide, not be so exceptional. Look how special we are, but like look what we can do, you know, together, you know, on this mission. So anyway, um, for the kids who go to school, ah, when you go to USC, that's not enough. If you don't have a family that's from USC, well, then you need mentors, you need internships, you need support, like all these programs, to be on the same playing field. So I guess things like this, like this discussion, and maybe even what some of you are doing out there is all part of what makes things fairer for kids, whether they go to NYU or to the new program or SMU or wherever. Great. Uh, Chanel, can you share one or two best practices or initiatives that you've seen or helped implement during your career to help address some of these critical gaps we've been talking about? Sure. Um, I, I feel really fortunate to sit at the intersection of um, gaming and entertainment and academia. So I've, my career has primarily been in academia. Um, I worked at NYU <laughs> as the assistant dean of diversity at Tisch School of the Arts. Um, that's the job that I am leaving to join Take Two Interactive. So this intersection just feels really brilliant for me. Um, and it allows me to focus my efforts in an industry that is not as traditional and stuck in, stuck in bureaucracy, right? So we can innovate more quickly. It was time to align myself with the future, right? So this all feels really, really relevant. Uh, I think what we can do is be very, very intentional. Intentionality is so, so, so important. So pre-employment, really investing in uh, pipeline development, right? And thinking about that scientifically in terms of like cognition <laughs> and young minds and when is the ideal time to start engaging them in this thought of possibility and opportunity, right? Even if it's simple and subtle and just con maintaining consistency and regularity. Um, you know, 
making sure that we're investing in ways that may not always even translate into ROI, right? Our partnerships at Take-Two are not contingent on ROI, and that's huge for me, um, right? So working with folks from the Covenant House who are homeless, right? And knowing that we are a company that's creating access to help them with interviewing skills, right? <laughs> so that we're socializing communities in very different ways. So there's pre-employment. And then when folks do get to us, really thinking about our entry-level work, I think about our QA teams, right? And I think about how much desire they have to climb the ladder, but we haven't designed visibility and growth, right? So pouring into our community in ways that say, if you desire to move into a different area of the company, to move into de development, this is a clear set pathway and these are the resources that we will provide and invest in you, right? Of course, barring performance and all those fantastic things, right? Um, so really being able to be very intentional about what our strategy is. I think the Gerald A. Lawson uh, Endowment Fund, I, I, I just, the intentionality behind it, right? When we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, do we all define it the same? <laughs> are we all on the same page about what that means and what populations we're specifically focusing on? Why I love this foundation is we focus very intentionally on indigenous and black individuals, right? We're very, very specific about what gaps we're closing. So, you know, I think that there's just all around 360 ways to dive in and we can all play a part, right? Even if it's, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a financial, right, commitment. It could really be just the social emotional investment, right, that we are placing into specific communities very intentionally across the globe. Um, so, Committing to mentorship, having folks there to drive mentorship, and growing at scale, right? Um, so I think about one thing that I am innovating in our global strategic plan at Take Two is really changing the narrative on what our employee resource groups are. Um, so traditionally at organizations, employee resource groups become communities of folks who share an affinity and they end up doing a ton of free labor <laughs> around programming. Right, and our ERGs end up programming all of our heritage months and history programs, and folks end up saying, this is BS, I'm burnt out, this is voluntary, right? So changing that model to say, why are we gonna put more labor on groups that have historically been underrepresented and provide yet another obstacle <laughs> for them evolving? So instead our model has shifted and we're focused on community building and telling the folks from you know, within Take Two, building community is enough. This is about you, this is about finding joy, this is about building connections and building network networks, and then it's our responsibility as a company to invest in you through conference development, through mentorship, so that we're creating those pathways. So really just being innovative. I also think, to, to, to put it out there, um, the ways in which we think about credential. <laughs> there are probably amazing folks out there that can be developed without a degree. Right, and it takes us being really, really intentional and investing in ways and being able to assess Chris that says, these are a community of folks that, you know, how do we assess potential, <laughs> right? So being able to move away from tradition that says you have to be credentialed, you have to follow this pathway, that's the only thing that will qualify you for success. I think we need to think about qualifiers of, su of success to really open up some pathways. Wonderful. Um yeah, I, I just that? want to agree, just because um, I think um, it's sort of like fun, you know, if it was like mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics, we're at a game conference, right? Where I think that competition used to be the aesthetic by which we decided who was a value, right? And so if you get the best score or go to the best school or come from the best place, blah, 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 then you win. Versus, I, I know for our scholars, we do community service, right? And things that everyone can do. And like, how do you um, make others around you better? How do you care about the earth or care about the world that you're in? Um, which is something that anyone can do, um, but then starting to prioritize that, like and prioritize sort of values and you know making those values valuable versus the ability to defeat other people at stuff, which is uh, which is a thing, but is not necessarily the defining trait <laughs> you want going forward <laughs> in your organization. Um, opinion. <laughs> Uh, speaking on, on collaboration and the mentorship aspect, Chanel, that you had mentioned, um, I understand that there are companies and nonprofits working together to bridge these gaps in many ways. Uh, and one in particular is the mentorship program between Take Two Interactive and Urban Arts. Uh, Pip Chanel, uh, I think this speaks to access and creatively addressing these gaps. Could you share more about this partnership with us and what the results have been? 
I'm going to pass it to you. Equity of voice. Um, well, in, in, uh, in the summer of 2020, I don't think Alan Lewis is here, but he, Alan Lewis from Take Two, uh, we were just having a conversation. Our students were um, disengaged and disconnected from the world, of course, and, uh, and we had a conversation around what if we brought together our students and the amazing employees of Take Two and all the subsidiaries. Uh, so, th so we created this mentorship program. Alan said at the beginning, let's try with like one or two employees. We're a bit tentative. Is this going to work? Um, and, it, and it just snowballed. And we said, let's start with three. And then before we knew it, two weeks later, we had 20 employees sort of banging down the door and saying, we really want to connect with, you know, with these, these underrepresented students. And so what, what grew and, and continues to be an amazing program today, and we're serving about, we're doing about 40 mentorships a year, um, is, are these, you know, these, these mentorships that, that are very two-way street, right? It's not just the, the, uh, the take two rock star employee mentoring one of our students. It's a very two-way street in, in terms of what they get out of it. There's a lot of mentoring, there's resume writing, there's, there's the world of work in, in the gaming industry. Um, but it's been amazing because these mentorships have lived beyond the initial sort of eight to ten week uh, initial design. And these um, and our alumni, these students, now our students are in college, and they're keeping in touch. I even ran into one of them yesterday, uh, Chad Rocco, who used to be at Take Two, now is at uh, Amazon Game Studios. Um, but these mentorships are continuing, and they're very organic, and it's a very beautiful thing. And that's really grateful for Take Two taking a chance on us with that. Our kids were the the the, the people they got to meet and actually have one-on-one -on -one relationships. I mean, I'm a soccer fan. For me, to be like meeting Lionel Messi. I mean, these were like real uh, luminaries in, in the field of, of, of the industry. So it was just very transformative. Not me, the company. So I'm happy to be a part of it. <laughs> Sorry? That's no, I was just giving credit right, to our commitment. <laughs> Like the sorry, we're just it's, I'm just observer, right? We're just, what do you think so the birth of New York, like the games hub? Because like back in the day, back in my day, like <laughs> you know, you'd be like San Francisco or Austin or Boston or LA, but you see all these programs being put in place and all this sort of leadership and energy being put from you know from lower grades up, right? And the result is is gonna be super powerful and interesting as all these young people grow and sort of take their place. Who are going to be, oh, I'm from New York. Where are you from? New York. Oh, you New York because of all the things that you're Go doing. But, but great. Even great. Even better. Even better. Or even more inclusive. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and the support of a company the size of a take two, yeah. working with a community organization, and then in the public schools. I mean, it's those public private partnerships, I think, that really are going to fuel access and, and you know, improve on equity issues. So you're in the right place. But I mean, just basically redefining what it means to be a game developer from New York, right? Because there'll be secondary questions now. They're like, were you in this program or that program? Because coming from New York will mean that you had access to a host of resources to make you more additive to the game space. It's, I don't know, I'm just sort of taking it all in right now. Like, seeing all the people show up, like, I thought there'd be nobody. Look at y'all, the pandemic masks on, showing up, like, New York rolling deep for this? Okay, like, no, just super real. Like, it, it's, it's very... I've been in games for oh, 28 years. Like this is objectively impressive. The friction that you've overcome to have this discussion, like just top to bottom. It's a moment. And also the games for change people. By the way, making us all run. By the way, in case no one said thank you, thank you, games for change people yes, for getting you. us all here. Like real talk. Like this is super cool. Anyway, onward. Uh, are there other examples of companies working together creatively to support the needs of underrepresented, under-resourced students, uh, either at the School of Interactive Arts, PIP, or more broadly? Well, I've talked enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, I might, I might uh, preempt um, future questions, but I'll say there, there are many other examples. Um, so uh, w one, one of the things that we look for in our education programs are opportunities to link um, universities, um, feeder programs, all the way down to middle school and prior um, with companies like ourselves. And um, we do see examples of that. Um, I, I would offer one that, that we have going now. Um, we're in our third year with the Longview Independent School District, which is out near, it's in Texas, near Louisiana. Um, they've been, un, until very recently, under um, court-ordered desegregation. 
And um, we were looking to be able to make an impact in a community like that where, I mean, they're not a tech savvy community, but they are uh, coming up. They are under um, land grants and, uh, you know, they, they have some uh, oil money surrounding them. But um, the school districts themselves are not that well resourced. They're able to access, though, these days more um, federal uh, grant funding and um, able to bring tech into their schools. So when we partner with uh, in this case, uh, Texas A&M, Prairie View A&M, HBCU, the two land-grant universities in Texas, um, with the Longview Independent School District, and, and locally there, Letourneau University, who have a great computer science program, and then couple that with our near-peer mentor program, um, which is funded through the Simons Foundation, um, we're able to connect um, college students who have similar identity backgrounds to these middle and high school students, and then give them context to talk to each other in a curriculum to do it. Um, I'd like to see something like that proliferate in more communities. I love what you're doing with Take Two. You know, I think those, uh, you know, if we can find more examples of that that are going to, it's sort of the think local, you know, uh, uh, you know, a act strong in a local area and then let that grow globally. Um, you know, we, we see uh, examples in Alabama. Um, we see examples in Orlando with uh, FIA, the EA program, and they're working with high school students. Um, and I think that there are a lot of these kind of gems around. It would be nice to collect them and kind of create a compendium of um, all these wonderful programs that are happening and maybe, you know, thread the needle through them so that we can kind of be a little more effective um, in how, the, how they're growing. Well, I think it's like a second generation discussion, right? The first generation was how many game schools are there? We've seen like the ESA map, right? Where it's like, there's, I don't know, hundreds of schools offering college programs, but not necessarily 100 programs to get there, right? There was no way there. And for some kids, there was no way out, right? When you got out of those programs. And now there's that sort of second level of thought. Like, how do we prepare young people to, to be in these programs in a meaningful way? How do we prepare them to actually be a part of your workforce? You know, yeah, and, and in a way that strengthens way. what those students can do and, and sort of does no harm as well. Since, I mean, there, there are a lot of college programs also that, that teach kind of um, similar surface level material that I think really should be taught starting in middle school. Um, and, I, and I don't think it's doing a lot of good for these students to start their path when they get into a college program. And yes, now they're burning college debt on things that really they should have had access to when they were much younger. Um, so I, I think that's the sort of path, right? There are not a lot of feeder programs. It's hard to find teachers. Teachers tend to not be paid that well, and then you have to, they, the, you know, school districts have to compete with us. So do universities. Um, so we need a way to um, help all those students who want to get access uh, find their pathway in, even though they have these barriers in front of them, whether it's, um, you know, teacher shortage or material shortage or just lack of awareness, whatever it is. But those feeder programs are critical. And I definitely am not seeing enough of those. Yeah, and uh, Aaron, you're actually working on a platform right now that uh, helps bring these tools to younger students. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how you're democratizing game development tools for, for underrepresented youth? Thank you. I would love to. Great question. <laughs> um, so, uh, we see, uh, I see and we see, I have a, um, a, a great cabal um, I work with, some of whom are, are here today, uh, Sean Reardon and Jeff McPhee, who kind of share these, these visions um, of where we can go. Um, and it helps that uh, Randy, uh, our founder, like a real strong advocate for um, bringing this kind of education into schools and improving access. Um, so we see uh, where we're moving with virtual desktop infrastructure and, and cloud tech as a, as a, you know, I'm going to use the word, the phrase, it, it is a game changer. I mean, it is, um, we can not only provide access to specific tools in the cloud, so in our case, we have Unreal running in the cloud, we have a lot of the content development tools that we use uh, running in the cloud. We've been doing research and development with tech partners on this for a number of years. But we can also um, provide access to our entire infrastructure. Right? So it's one thing to be able to learn how to use a tool. It's another thing to be able to use that tool in the context of how we actually make games. And then beyond that, it's another thing to learn how to do that with that infrastructure with direct content, you know, c contact with people in the industry or professionals or, um, you know, people who, are, who were working in the industry or are now really motivated by these ideas. 
and, and are in schools. So to be able to network all those things together, um, that is what we're doing with the platform that, that we're building. Um, that platform is part of the um, piloting work that we've been doing in schools. And um, we want to go you know, further um, with that and deeper and make it something that um, students not, well, in, in school and out of school learners have easy access to. Um, you know, we, many of us came up through the modding community. There was, I mean, the two, what was it, 2003 that the first version of the IGDA framework was released. You know, it wasn't until 2008 that the first, you know, uh, approved certified version of that uh, curriculum um, happened. And in that time, we saw the prolif proliferation of programs um, throughout colleges. Um, and we've lost the modding community for the most part, unfortunately. A lot of it having to do with what were very hackable games back in the day or very locked down today. Um, and the um, development ecosystems that that kind of modding activity can happen in is pretty locked down. So if you want to be able to work with others, you have a very few options in which to do it. Um, uh, or you can go to a, a game school um, and uh, like a USC and be paired with others uh, in, in your disciplines. Um, you also get the opportunity to pay a lot to do that. Um, and so we think that uh, when we talk about democratization, it's, um, it's a, a global access and awareness uh, and, and transformative effort through, through tech. It's not, it's not tech for tech's sake, right? We have this, these pilots in, in uh, these districts that, that we're growing, um, and uh, we can only go so far so what this does is it enables us to scale those programs where we don't have to have all of our internal mind share um, helping to do teacher training and working with students all the time because we want to grow beyond what we can do as one organization. We want to partner with other organizations to do this and to create a community like we kind of used to have with the modding community, but in this more formal setting where everything's more complex, mm -hmm. where it's much harder and there's so many more specializations. Um, so that's the idea. Yeah, it's sort of neat how sort of intentionality sort of, and freedom are sort of coming together. Um, just get super meta, because we love meta here, right? <laughs> it's like, it's, so school education used to be a little bit like, like Web3 NFTs are now, where not everyone had the best outcome design for the people participating in it. Some people were just trying to get some money. Right? And no, some people are trying to do very noble things. They got real roadmaps, they're gonna do real stuff, but a lot of people are just trying to get some money. And that was their outcome. And I think uh, uh, now we're seeing something a little more intentional about what education means, what education at different levels means. Um, and, but with an eye towards an outcome of growing the industry, I think that in some ways education, I'll put it in italics, outpaced the industry's demand for it. Right? And now you're seeing things which are more systemic, like system, right? where schools and companies and youth programs are all coming together with like a shared outcome. And we'll reap the benefits of that, much like someday, like your NFTs and you will be very reputable and do all sorts of powerful, meaningful identity things, even if many of them might not for you today, where it's more of like a get money thing versus a move things forward in a meaningful way thing. Hey, Gordon, can I ask him sure. a question? Of course. Right. Uh, sure. How much time have we got? About a minute. A minute. <laughs> well, I, I'll just I'll share an observation, which when I, when I, I asked our students uh, about NFTs, and, and not so much the metaverse, but blockchain, and they were so down the middle, so very negative on that whole concept, right? Um, and I find that fascinating uh, in the students that we serve. I don't know if you've encountered it, but I was expecting like, oh yeah, because I was like, Let's, should we create a course around this? They're like, yes. we have very little interest or very, a lot of distrust around it. It's interesting. Well, well, I think there's a narrative around ownership. And I'll go back to the original talk of like, do you consume things? Do you produce things? Do you own things? I guarantee you, you sit around a room of people whose parents own shit, they'll be like, NFTs are great. I can own this and that and this and that and I can trade and blah, 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 blah. Right, because their perspective is that ownership is an outcome that is designed for them until you sort of have a mindset that you could own take two, right? Get some stock, right? I can own the Knicks, I can buy some shares, right? Then your view of NFTs, sure, it's speculative because you're like, oh, what's in it? You need to come to talk to them then. That's I what probably I do. I'll come by. Come Let's have a real talk though. Like, it really, it really is that basic though. Sorry, I know we only admit it, but like mm -hmm. for everyone at home, right? If you can't picture owning the place in which you, great value, well then you'll, I don't know, you'll never see the top floor, you'll never, your perspective will never be the same 
and you'll make choices which are not in the interest of the business because you can't see the business. You can only see what you're working on. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation, and we are very excited to uh, the, for the future of the games industry and to see where we go from here. So thank you all. Thank you.